So my entire thing is, is the lemon worth the squeeze, right? How much of time actually are you spending in trading? How much of time and, and at the end of it, how are you able to quantify the benefits, whether it's worth it or not? That's the first thing you, you need to need to look at. Do not force force fit AI where it's not required. I have seen people, you know, trying to just force fit fit AI just because it is cool. So that's what I would tell people to avoid. And that's what I've been telling my clients to avoid as well. Thanks. How about you, Dr. Sue? Um, so I think uh, in terms of implementation of best practices, I think we, we talked a little bit about it here. I think the first question that Barzan Henri talked about it, what is your current state and where should you be deploying AI, et cetera, right? I think the second part of it is in the implementation, you have to look at the model integrity. And when whatever technique you're using, it doesn't matter. What is the model that you're building? What is the data that you're building it on? And how much can you rely, uh, how, how confident are you about that model in terms of replicability, stability, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're talking about model integrity, you're going to talk about a set of inputs that are very, very important. So there's people inputs, there's the data engineering inputs, there's the tool, the different data sources, the cleanliness of the data, the quality of the data, the accuracy of the data, upon which perhaps you're trying to then at least discern a pattern or sets of trends, right? At a very minimum, you're going to try and do that. Then then ties to the cost, performance, ex quality, et cetera. So I think in terms of implementation of best practices, the best practices that I have seen are where you have the data engineering team and love what Barsan said, actually, here's the, here the vendor group and here's the data engineering team or the internal group, right? There are two groups, but remember that the business case where you're trying to deploy it has to tie to the set of stakeholders upon which you're trying to get to the business outcome. You're not going to build something, hopefully, that doesn't tie to revenue. People are not going to invest in that. So part of it is agnostic, again, of tool technique, agnostic of whether you can create anomaly detection. The fundamental question is going to be is, what is a model? And is that model, can I rely on the integrity of that model? All the other things will fall in, all the sets of inputs, the sets of activities, the types of tools, techniques, et cetera, that you want to build it on will fall. If you can say, you know, cohesively and coherently that I can rely on this model and I can replicate this model and therefore I can justify the $10 million that yields $100 million revenue, right? So to me, that's the best practice that I have seen. Prashant, Dr. Prashant, can you, uh, get, what do you have to say in terms of yeah, so this is, success? Yeah, this is great conversation. I'm loving every every line of what people are saying here. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about... <laughs> I'll talk about my perspectives. So basically, uh, taking over where Sue and Bazan left, first is uh, assess your maturity, which is all about your capability, resources, and everything. So there is one saying I often tell my clients and prospects, there is no point in preaching religion to a hungry man. So you need to understand what your current capabilities are and what your resources that are available so that before you talk about AI, ML, and everything. The first step is that, which is an extension of what Bazan and uh, Sue said. Next, number two, is start small, think big, go fast. This is how you build your <laughs> So, So Sue was talking about the impacts. I, I have a kind of a template where I ask my clients to follow this four-stage template in building the use cases. The first one is, what is the problem? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Next, number two, so what? What is the business impact? Talk about that. Number three, now what? Now you talk about all the probable solutions you have to solve this problem and the AI could be one of the solutions to solve this problem. And lastly, then what? What are we going to do with this, which is to implement the solutions? I have this four-stage problem, a four-stage uh, template to solve this second stage about building this uh, use case. And lastly, the most important one, I believe, is what Sue said in the initial stage when she opened the conversation, which is about governance. So very few people are thinking about governance as a kind of uh, a last step in the whole process. So in my view, it should be one of the fundamental yes. thing. It should be discussed in every uh, conversation, in every step. Governance has to be discussed. Now, when, when I say governance, is not about policing and controls. It's about making sure that you strike a balance between kind of a data democratization and data protection. So it's about striking the balance between the two. 
you can't be unidimensional and go all the way saying that, hey, I want to talk about data as oil, blood, and all those things. But at the same time, you can't go to the other end where I say, I want to protect my data and not give it to anybody else. So you need to strike a balance between the two that I call it as data, go data governance. And today, when it comes to governance in AI, we are talking too much about or a lot about ethics and explainability, fairness, biases, all those things come into the picture. And before I leave, uh, uh, Rob, I just want to say one thing about the data part of it and its context to AI. The inherent state of data itself, there is a bias in the data that's captured. Yes. So that means the bias is carried forward to AI models as well. And here is one more reason why you need governance on the AI models, the, AI, the data used in the models, so on and so forth. So thank you. Um, Clinton. Yeah, so as we think about some of the challenges that data engineers and teams face, um, while working at Amazon Web Services, we had this idea of working backwards. So working backwards from the goal or what's the objective? How do we get there? So the goal or the outcome that we're seeing companies achieve is running 50% more workloads for their same budget, achieving 99% of their SLAs, and launching applications three times faster. So the way that they're doing this is they're able to get the visibility that they need and correlate all these error messages, logs, traces, uh, to just be able to understand and then diagnose and resolve issues. So doing that manually is incredibly difficult, but using AI, suddenly it's a perfect way to sift through all this information. In fact, one uh, organization I spoke with, they described it as not just finding a needle in the haystack, but also finding the haystack because there's so much that they have to do to debug data analytics code, running in production um, to be able to discover these data, data layout and partitioning issues, code inefficiencies. Um, so the number of new applications they can deploy in a given time period is uh, restricted. But now with AI to help augment their decisions and quickly discover and address these issues, they're able to go much faster. Thank you, Clinton. So Barzan, you've got a lot of customers who've achieved um, cost savings and query uh, warehouse, uh, op using warehouse optimization, using your product. Um, and so you've learned some things about good starting points and best practices and, 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 and on that journey to success. So uh, could you share with some of those, that, that, that success formula? Sure. Uh, to be honest with you, like I've, sort of live this question, right? Like this is, this was the aha moment for me when we, when I decided to sort of go from academia to put something in, in, in the customer's hands. I right? like for years and years, like I worked with some of the smartest PhD students that you can imagine, like we would publish these amazing, brilliant ideas in the top tier database and machine learning conference. And then ask ourselves like, why are companies not adopting this, right? So essentially what it all came down was like only two keywords, like, all of this stuff is fun, but at the end of the day, what we realize is that only two things that there are only two things that matter. One is evaluation, and the other thing is adoption. I like as a vendor, the only thing that matters at the end of the day is adoption. If the customer is not successful, if they fail to you know see the value, if they fail to evaluate it, you don't get to that adoption. From the customer's perspective, they adopt things when they can evaluate something, right? And they can evaluate it and and, and decide on whether this solves the problem that they have. So. What we basically, I mean, you're asking for the success formula. We actually broke it down into four things, right? Time to implement, time to value, cost to value, and risk to value. Those are the four things, right? The first one was like, how long or how much effort does a customer have to put in before they can actually put this in production? Like if the customer has to go and spend month and month collecting and cleaning data and learning things and migrating data, you're not going to get to that fast adoption. So that's the first thing that we, we you know, we, we figured it out. Like time to value has to be, time to implement has to be insanely short. The second thing, time to value also has to be really short, at least like to build a relationship with the customer, with the team, right? If you basically have to spend, you know, a month defining what the success criteria is and three, three more months evaluating it and three more months after that, deciding whether you've hit the success criteria, that's too late. The train has already left the station. Time to value has to be insanely short, ideally, you want the customer to click on a few things and see actual value, actual savings in, in our case. Are you talking about that same day, that same week? Pretty much, exactly. So like, you know, if you know if, if you can't really deliver that 
you're not able to sort of gain that kind of attention from the team to trust you on the next steps. And like, especially with cost saving, like, and you know, it's really important that the time to value has to be insanely short. Like, you know, we started showing customers, hey, you know what? All I need from you is 30 minutes of your time. You don't have to give up anything. You don't have to put in any work. Within 24 hours, you're gonna see savings, right? And then the third step was, okay, you know, what's the, you know, this is related to what uh, Prashant was saying, like the cost of it. So what's the cost to value? Right? Like if I have to spend, you know, $20,000 to save $10,000, if I have to spend $2 million to save two and a half million dollars, it's not a very good ROI, right? So like we started thinking about, you know what, how about we just charge you one third of whatever we end up saving, right? Which is much easier when you're dealing with cost saving, you know, but it's it's more complicated if it's about data quality and whatnot. So like always starting with the with money is a good place to start. Like if you're someone who's excited about ML, always like my recommendation is look for a place where they can actually show money. Like everyone understand the language of money. And then the last thing is add risk to value. How much, how much as a data team, how much should I expose myself? How much should I expose my data? How much risk should I take on to actually evaluate your solution? Like if I have to give you access to my most critical and most expensive digital asset, which is my data warehouse, and let you see all the dirty laundry and you may or may not be able to save me money, that's not a very compelling use case. So like figure out how you can actually deliver value by maybe, tra- you know, just training your models and metadata. That's, that's the fourth thing that we learned. Like how can we sort of train models without even, forget about storing customers' data, without even seeing their data. Can you just look at the telemetry? Can you just look at metadata and, and, and do this? So like, again, time to implement, time to value, value, uh, cost to value and, and risk to value. That's at least the formula that's, that seems to have worked for a lot of our customers.